President, what do you miss most about not being in the White House? I can't say that I miss anything. I uh, was in the White House because it was a job, and that was the headquarters for the job. But I never got to the, uh, into the frame of mind where I felt like I had to have it. Don't you miss the access to information? It's a matter of procedure. And it's just because we can make rules and abide by them. The French can't. Not too bad. Can we ask the president to talk? Let's see if he wasn't All right. I hope this goes. Can't up. even hear them all. Okay. Mr. President, do you miss not being in the White House? No, I don't. Uh, physically, of course, I miss the uh, information that was available there and miss the access to the sources of information which were in the Library of Congress. Uh, those are the two things that I miss most, but as to uh, the White House itself and the responsibility connected with it, I'm very happy to be out from under it. The White House is a very pleasant place to live, but it's just like living behind an iron fence or behind bars, really. I used to call it the Great White Jail. I imagine that was the truth, but I've always felt that uh, a man... In the 1952 campaign, the Republican slogan was Korea, Corruption, and Communism. We have dealt with uh, corruption and with communism, or rather with uh, corruption in Korea. What about communism in the government? I don't think there was ever enough... I think it's very efficient and very effective, and its direction under uh, Edgar Hoover has been in the right line. They've never tried to make a Gestapo out of it. They've tried to protect the government of the United States and to run down interstate criminals in uh, automobile thefts and uh, kidnappings and things of that sort, and they've been very successful at it. Do you believe the government has any right to inquire into the political affiliations of government employees who are in non-sensitive jobs? I think government employees ought to have exactly the same liberties that the first ten amendments of the Constitution guarantee. And I've said time and again that I thought the Un-American Activities Committee in the House of Representatives is about the most un-American thing in America. Uh, did you, in fact, refer to Alfred Hess as a red herring? No. The situation was such that I was trying to uh, arrange uh, some very important matters with the Congress. And in order to... Uh, prevent the consideration of those things, these charges were made that the government was lined with communists. And somebody asked me if that wasn't a red herring, keep from putting my program over, and that's where the conversation came from. I didn't in initiate the thing at all. Some questionnaire in the audience, and he was over there once, asked that question, but he asked a question that fitted the bill exactly, in my opinion. Are you content with the verdict regarding this? I don't know anything about the evidence in the matter at all, but uh, Hiss's friends uh, informed me that they didn't think Hiss was guilty of anything. That's all I based my uh, statement on. Of course, Hiss was not convicted of disloyalty. He was uh, convicted of not telling the truth to a committee. Mr. President, we were talking the other day about uh, uh, your removal of General MacArthur, and you uh, used the one inappropriate word, namely insubordination. I wonder if you would tell us again just how that was done. Well, uh, uh, MacArthur had been... And uh, just how did you go about that? What were the steps involved? Well, uh, we called in the, uh, I called in the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Chief of Staff of the Army, and the uh, uh, Ambassador at Large on the Marshall Plan and the 4.4 program. That was Averill Harriman and General Bradley, General Marshall, and Dean Atchison. And uh, asked them what the situation, how the situation would develop on this second uh, letter to Joe Martin, who was the leader of the uh, minority in the House. And uh, Dean Atchison made the statement that he thought it would be a uh, bad thing to uh, relieve 
General Marshall because he was immensely popular and the people in the Far East thought he was uh, next door to the Almighty and they might feel that we were falling down on what we were trying to do. General Marshall said he hoped I'd postpone the situation until he had had a chance to read the, uh, the messages uh, over the last two years and he also made the statement that he had matters pending before the Congress which might be affected by it. General Bradley said he ought to be fired. He's a good military man. Uh, Avril Harriman, the ambassador, said if he were in my place, he'd have fired him long ago. Well, I didn't tell him what I had in my mind. I told him to come back in two days, or the next morning, I forget which it was, and they came. The president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and that means the control of the armed forces of this republic are under civilians instead of under military men, and I had to exercise that prerogative just as Lincoln and James K. Polk and other presidents have done. Mr. President, uh, when you were in the White House, how did you handle your speech-making arrangements? Well, uh, when it was necessary to make a speech of uh, national and international importance, or even just uh, a, a speech for the information... Up suit, which I wore, like I always did. <laughs> you go barefoot in the summertime? 
Not after I was 10 years old. I never went barefooted after I was 10 years old because uh, I didn't care much about going barefooted, but before that time, I used to go barefooted all the time, sometime out on the farm. What kind of food did you eat in those days? Oh, we had everything in the world you could think of. We had uh, hot biscuits and, and uh, sorghum and bacon and ham and scrambled eggs and milk and, and everything you could think of for breakfast and the same sort of a dinner. You ever had pie for breakfast? No, not on the farm. The only time I ever had pie for breakfast was after I was a United States Senator. Went up to Maine to make an investigation. They took me to a breakfast and they had apple pie for breakfast. That's the first time I ever had pie for breakfast. That was in Portland, Maine. What, what's your earliest memory of your grandmother? Well, my grandmother was uh, uh, present in uh, in uh, Har uh, let's see, in Harrisonville, I think it was, in the farm outside of Harrisonville, at the time of the birth of my brother. And I remember her very distinctly when she came out and found me ringing the dinner bell and chasing the frog around the house. I can remember that instant very well. I was only two years old. Did you and your brother generally get on well together? Always. We never had any disagreement with the past. A number of ignorant people who are not black, they're white. And they can be swayed by uh, such actions. I, that's the only way I can analyze it. We have a demagogue from what it's supposed to be, the wisest state in the union, that's Wisconsin. And uh, it's not because the people up there are ignorant, I'm sure because that produced the two of the pilots, two of the finest men that ever came to the Senate of the United States. And uh, it's a hard thing to analyze, and it's one that's not uh, a, a thing that I should be talking about publicly, but it's a part of the history of the country. And every republic has been uh, troubled with such men, and I think we, as our education improves, we'll be able to survive any sort of a democracy. I hope so, because of it's the greatest republic in the history of the world. I want to see it continue. Um, what do you recall as the period before you became president? In your entire life when you were most depressed, when you felt that the bottom dropped out of things? Well, I never was one to be depressed. Whenever things went wrong, I usually got my dander up and wanted to fight, and I never, I don't go on depression. Either physically, Personally or nationally. <laughs> Were you impressed when uh, your store folded? Oh, yes, of course. I felt very badly about it because uh, we couldn't pay all our obligations, but we finally did get them all paid to settle. That was a, a rather depressing period. And of course, when my father died, I felt very badly because he and I were very close partners and uh, understood each other very well. And uh, when, of course, any member of the family passed on, it, it, it was depressing. But personally, uh, those depressions didn't last very long with me because uh, I always had a philosophy that the things are in front of you and not behind you. You've got to do something to make them come about. If you don't, why they won't. And you kept up with the long correspondence with your sister and your mother, didn't you? Yes, I always, uh, every time I was away from home, I always wrote my mother and sister. And when I was away from Mrs. Truman, I always wrote her. My trip to South America, I wrote her every day. And wrote the family usually by, uh, mother and sister usually about once a week. And whenever it was necessary, I'd write to my brother. But he and I never carried on any prolonged correspondence because uh, we usually talk to each other when we have anything to say. He called me up just the other day to give me a message that he get written me just as well. Mm -hmm. uh, did you get uh, a mail count of some sort when you were in the White House to give you some idea of how the incoming mail was running? Yes, uh, they. Uh, they usually counted it by the bushel. It came in three or four bushels a day and came by the hundreds. And it, it takes an immense number of clerks to sort that mail and send it in the direction it should go. See, the president has a uh, uh, great many assistants and three regular secretaries and a counselor. And a great deal of that mail can be uh, uh, guided through those offices and taken care of without coming to the desk of the president. Even with that, though, he has a tremendous mail that he has to pass on himself. Speaking of writing, what do you regard as the essentials? I was going to talk about the finances of the county, and I got up on the platform and I couldn't say anything. <laughs> do you remember what you said? 
nothing. I said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Turn around and walk out. <laughs> but I got elected. Everybody was in with me. <laughs> no, no applause when you walked out? Oh, they yelled at me, of course. They were all my friends. <laughs>
22nd and Park Avenue, 2108 Park. And I got a job in the National Bank of Commerce at $35 a month. And my brother got one in the First National Bank at the same price. And what they call the zoo, that's where they trained the boys to be bankers. And uh, Uncle Eisenhower, the president's brother, was in that zoo along with us. He's now the executive vice president of the Great Commerce Trust Company, the biggest bank in Kansas City. And I quit the bank, quit the commerce, the National Bank of Commerce. After that, went to Union National. And went there as a bookkeeper and got up to the front where I was making the tremendous sum of $125 a month. And then I went to the farm. My father and brother and I took over the family farm of about 600 acres and ran it. I stayed out there for about 10 or 12 years and the uh, war came along. And while I was in the bank, in the Union National Bank, I had... <laughs> that's where my military experience began. I then stayed in the National Guard and uh, far, but I stayed along then for two or three enlistments. And when the uh, Second World War came along on April 6, 1917, I helped organize a regiment of field artillery in Kansas City and Jackson County, known as the Second Missouri Field Artillery. There were two batteries in Independence and four batteries in the Supply and, and, and the Headquarters Company in Kansas City. And I was a lieutenant in Battery F of that organization. And uh, Captain Pete Allen, who was a brother of the famous dog, was the uh, captain of that battery. We went to Camp Donovan, and I trained there as a field artilleryman. Went to Fort Sale School, fired, did regular battery, battery duty, and ran a canteen. And got a promotion to captain while I was there, and was sent on an overseas detail to France for the study of the French 75 gun. At the school that uh, called the Second Corps School at Chantilly on Cersein in the uh, center where all the American training took place, the headquarters were long. And uh, I was sent back to the regiment after the school was over and made the adjutant of the Second Battalion, then put in command of Battery B on July 11th and took it to the front and uh, stayed with it until. The armistice, and then along in the latter part of April, I landed in France on the uh, 13th of the, on the 9th of April. No, I landed on the 13th of April, 1918, and left there on the 9th of April, 1919, and went out to uh, Camp Funston, was discharged as a captain of field artillery, and afterwards was commissioned as a major in the reserve corps and stayed with the reserve and finally became a colonel of the reserve. It was a right good story about that. After I was elected president the second time, General Bradley had been made chief of staff by me. I told him that I was a colonel of field artillery in the reserve corps and I wanted to keep that commission until I got out of the White House, even if I was beyond the age. Right about uh, in the middle of the term or somewhere along there, I received a grave certificate from the Pentagon. That Colonel Harry S. Truman, field artillery reserve, is hereby transferred to the inactive reserve by command of the president. And I called up Bradley and read it to him. He said, my, my, send that thing back over here. Somebody disobeyed orders. So you're not going to get that. That's the only one in existence and the only one that ever will be if I'm going to keep it. <laughs> and that's how I get discharged from the military service by myself without knowing it. <laughs> Did you ever leave in Paris while you were in France, Mr. Clinton? Yes. Uh, yeah, on December the 7th, after the armistice, uh, a number of the officers of the 129th Field Artillery were given a seven-day leave to go to Nice. And on the way, we stopped, uh, I think, two days in Paris and went to, I went to the Paris Opera to see Mignon and went to the, the uh, Opera Comique to see Carmen. And uh, then went with some of the boys to see the Folly Clagere, which I think was better than either one of the other shows. Reporter, because somewhere along the line, I neglected to ask you when you learned to play the piano. Well, when I was about, uh, well, I guess I must have been eight or nine years old, uh, we succeeded in raising enough money to buy a piano. And then I began to 
ticket from Callison's from Mrs. E.C. White, who was a pupil of Lex Tisky. She was the wife of the uh, superintendent of schools in Kansas City, E.C. White, a great educator and a wonderful man. And uh, for three or four years, I uh, learned a great many uh, of the great kind of pieces. In fact, Petrushki himself taught me how to play his new yet. Really? Yes. And the reason for that was that he also was a people of Les Tisky, the same as my music teacher was, and the same as all the great chemists of the time were. Levy and another one of them, Rosenthal, were all uh, pupils of Les Tisky, the famous Vienna piano teacher. And I got I remember the theme of some of the great uh, music that my good teacher was uh, taught me and gave me a good viewpoint of Beethoven and Bach and Chopin particularly, I'm fond of, but uh, in all the great operas, I want to say to you that most of the great operas are as embarrassing as they can be when you listen to them, but you go there sometimes just to hear one thing that's worth the price of admission. The rest of it's embarrassing to me, and I'm supposed to be a musician. My daughter, and the time, so far as music is concerned, we got you now almost from precinct to president. <laughs> uh, what, um, what do you think of the proposal of Cajun in advance that uh, former presidents should be honorary members of the Senate? In uh, the time I was in the Senate, I was instrumental in getting together some senators, and a bill was introduced way back there in the thirties sometime to make uh, former presidents and vice presidents uh, members of the House and the Senate. But I doubt if it ever will. The reason for that was my opinion that men who had served as presiding officers of the Senate, and some of them had been not only presiding officers of the Senate, but they had been speakers of the House, might be an asset and an advisory capacity to the legislative branch of the government due to the fact they knew something about the executive. But Well, I take it, Mr. President, from your record. ...to succeed in any, any line of business he takes up. Uh, president also must uh, like people. He must understand public relations. He must know how to get along with other people, because if he doesn't know how to get along with them, he will, and does become president, he will have a terrible time with the, the Congress and with the Supreme Court and the other courts of the country. If he uh, toughness in the face of politicians. Oh, well, if he's got a thin skin, he's got no business being in the presidency. He must uh, understand his own ideas of what's right and wrong, act on those ideas, and if the uh, uh, newspapers and the means of communication don't like what he does, let him say what they want to say. And then if he's in the same disposition I am, he'll get up and tell them what they're wrong.